Hello and welcome back once again to South Bank Live, the live show where we discuss the latest movements in markets and finance and dive behind the headlines as to what white might really be going on behind the scenes in the financial system. My name is Boaz Shoshan. Thank you uh, to everybody who does join uh, has tuned in this evening live for us. It is great to have a live audience for these. Uh, this week's guest is the uh, is the very popular John Butler, very popular South Bank Live guest. John, how are you getting on this evening? Oh, very well, Boaz. Thank you. Yeah, it's been quite a week indeed. All manner of different things that we could be discussing in this show. Uh, and I'm sure plenty of folks in the chat uh, will suggest a few things that they'd like us to discuss. I thought we could start off uh, the, this, this show in particular with the news that's been around for a few days now about uh, China doing lockdowns all over again. Uh, this is a very interesting story. There was a headline, I think, in the New York Times uh, regarding this, which I thought we could uh, we could dwell on for this week's show, which was just taking a look at how uh, Chinese Communist Party have started doing very large lockdowns all over again in China, and it makes me wonder what uh, what might be going on here and what it may mean for us as investors, as of course the pandemic and the lockdowns had a huge impact uh, on us uh, over the past for the past two years. Well, I mean, first of all, it's it's hard it's hard to get really good information here about precisely what's going on. I mean, if you look at the history of, of, of COVID, the pathology and mutations of COVID, you know, clearly they've gone towards being very infectious, but less virulent, which is normal for a virus in the wild. And yet here, you know, it's a bit eerie, right? When you think about it, because this is where it all began. So, so obviously it's like, oh my God, here we go again. But no, I think this is probably more coincidental. I think you simply have a rash of infections. It probably is virulent, but not, sorry, it probably is very contagious, but not particularly deadly, if at all. Uh, but China is probably uh, just reacting, uh, you know, once bitten, twice shy, and is doing a very, very quick, heavy-handed lockdown, uh, lockdown, which I suspect will be over fairly quickly. Now, that said, uh, I may be wrong, I may be wrong about that. Uh, and certainly the fact that it's lockdown however brief, is taking place in the midst of what is already just an outrageous uh, global supply challenge and situation, which is the COVID hangover being worked off, combined with, of course, the interruptions uh, that, are, that are being caused by the Ukraine war, sanctions, and so on. It's just adding more fuel to the fire of what could be seen as a negative supply shock contributing to this stagflationary set of conditions that we're clearly deep, deep into now. Yeah. Well, again, so many different aspects of that that we could explore. I think when it comes to the uh, supply chain shortages, as uh, we see them exhibited today, obviously the conflict in Ukraine has exacerbated a lot of things from the COVID lockdowns. And then on top of that, we now have new COVID lockdowns, which are going to exacerbate that even more. Could you explore that a little bit more for us, John? Uh, which commodities are we really thinking about here? And uh, how will they affect us over here in the UK? It's got to the point now where almost all commodities are affected with the exceptions of some relatively quirky markets. Things like coca and, and coffee are not really caught up, say, in, in what's going on here. But when it comes to all the major industrial commodities and when it comes to all the major grains, um, look, all of this stuff is going to be severely affected by what's going on. The fact is, is that grains, metals, uh, and energy, which comprise a huge portion uh, of you know, the overwhelming portion, really, when you think about it, of the global commodities trade, these are all impacted by the war in some way. And to the extent that China is now going into what I think will probably be a brief lockdown, of course, that has a huge impact on the manufacturing of, you know, of a huge range of, of, of products into which metals and energy are going. So, so the UK, look, it's a small open economy. The UK basically takes a set of economic conditions from the world, layers over a little bit of its own exchange rate and monetary policy, and the net result is the UK's macroeconomic environment. There's not a whole lot that happens here at home that really drives the business cycle. 
because the UK is a small open economy. That's just the nature of it. And of course, don't get me wrong. I mean, the, you know, the Bank of England will do what it can, I suppose, to try and you know buffer the impact of things. But sadly, as history demonstrates, when central banks try to accommodate negative supply shocks, there's really not a whole lot they can do. They can allow the inflation to rise or they can try to not allow the inflation to rise. But either way, the net, it's a net negative for the economy. And so the UK is simply going to have to deal with this. There's no there's no way out of it. There's no magic wand that Andrew Bailey can wave from a thread needle street uh, to to make these negative global supply shocks go away. Yeah. Though, of course, as investors, uh, when you're looking at the situation and you're thinking of the manner in which uh, one could uh, you know, protect your portfolio from this kind of commodity price spike or these these commodity uh, input stresses. I mean, where, exi- where exactly do you think the market hasn't sort of priced this in yet? So when we look at, obviously, we've seen uh, a big rise in a lot oh. of uh, different businesses in the commodity sector. But what do you think people haven't realized yet? Was the market not grasped? Well, look, this is a net negative. OK, it, 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 these supply shocks, shocks are net negatives. And really, ultimately, they're going to those those negatives are going to be most acutely felt where is there is the most leverage applied. And there's a hell of a lot more leverage in the financial system and in certain corporations than there is at the general household slash small business level. The problem is, of course, <laughs> that because that leverage is concentrated in you know the financial system and a a lot of corporations that are highly leveraged. Um, there's no escaping it, no matter how no matter how unleveraged you are. And so, where we really see it, in my opinion, is in risk premia. Risk premia have risen, and they have risen materially, but they've risen in some areas a lot, and in other areas not by very much. That to me is a disconnect. And one of the best examples of that disconnect is when you look is when you compare what's been happening in the high yield market with the equity market. Sure, the equity market has undergone a gentle correction, but you know, step back from a chart, a, a multi-year chart, and it doesn't look terribly meaningful. Whereas the credit market is really looking meaningful now. And if history is a guide, it's pointing to more general equity market weakness ahead as people's expectations for corporate profit growth take a big hit. We'll get to the credit market in a moment because that is a very big story. And of course, it has uh, huge implications as well for the broader financial system. But just staying with this uh, return of lockdowns, because you get this sort of terrible sense of deja vu here where lockdown, we thought we'd kind of gotten past that. Uh, we'd gotten past the, the 2020s. Now we, we've started just the new crisis, which is the, the war in Ukraine. And uh, conveniently, COVID has pretty much evaporated from so many of the news headlines that we were used to seeing every single day. Um, the, but just to get back to this uh, this headline, which I thought was very, uh, very interesting. China's COVID lockdown set to further disrupt global supply chains. Surge in Omicron variant infections has prompted Chinese authorities to lock down residents, close factories and stop truck traffic. Um, snarling already frayed supply chains, which is very, uh, you know, uh, as you say, oh, it just pours more fuel uh, in, in some ways, uh, literally, when you're looking at uh, energy markets on the raging price fire for this stuff. And uh, like when you when you think that this is a temporary thing, John, could you expand on why that is? Because if it isn't temporary, uh, the, you know, the consequences could be quite grave indeed. Well, I think the Chinese lockdown is likely to be temporary because it seems to me, although it's difficult to get good data on this in real time, it seems to me that they may be seeing a spike in infections, but I don't believe they're seeing a meaningful spike in hospitalizations. So this is really a cautionary thing, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve sort of thing from a, the Chinese perspective. That's my understanding of what's going on. So while they may have imposed a lockdown, I don't think it's going to have anything like the duration of the ones that we saw prior early on when, of course, things kind of kicked off in China. I don't think this is a repeat of that. That's my guess anyway. But the problem is, is given how how screwed up uh, so many supply chains now are, given the negative supply shocks making their way through the system in the form of higher prices, the limited uh, supply, rationing and restrictions in some places, things that might also be happening here in the UK, 
I mean, it, it just it, it takes a situation that's already bad and potentially makes it a lot worse because these things are nonlinear, right? You you can you can absorb a certain amount of negative supply shock and make do with existing inventory stockpiles and whatnot. But beyond a certain point, you know, all your backup plans, all, all your plan B's are are exhausted and you're just staring a complete lack of of, of input in the face. You know, so if you're if you're a steel mill and there simply isn't any iron ore available at any price, you, know, you have to shut the thing down. And that potentially bankrupts firms. So, so this is the sort of thing that that even a little bit more fuel on the fire can, can make that bad situation disproportionately worse, you know, given where we currently are. Certainly. And uh, doesn't it doesn't feel like there's any shortage of the of problems that are making this worse at the minute. Uh, is there any green shoots you've seen on the horizon that may that make you think that this stress uh, will be alleviated in the near term? Well, there were briefly, but then this war kicked off. Uh, there were. So, for example, if you take a look at I, I just mentioned iron ore, actually, if you take a look at the price of iron ore, it actually had been trending down for months. It, 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 it was trending down for months. Also, the price of bulk shipping, of which iron ore is a large component, but there are other components like coking coal and many other many other raw commodities uh, form the, the bulk shipping demand and supply in the market. But the Baltic Dry Index, which, which is the benchmark measure of this, came off really, really hard for a good few months there. These were indicators that the COVID-related supply disruptions were actually being worked off. They were finally beginning to be worked off, thank God. And yet, all of a sudden, this war breaks out, sanctions go up, and they affect a huge portion of the world's landmass, uh, which, of course, is energy, yeah, food, and other other commodities and you know metals and whatnot, and, and you know take a look at a map. I mean, look how much of the world is currently affected by this. It's it's, it's massive. Yeah. So so this is it's really something which um, we were gradually coming out of it, and indeed the rate of increase in producer prices had already leveled off. Uh, so the second derivative, uh, a, a, as it were, was suggesting that the first wave of what of all this all these stagflationary forces was already beginning to, to sort of settle a bit. And then this comes along. And and, and again, it, it, so so yes, there were some green shoots, but it's like when you know when you get a spring thaw, but then all of a sudden you get a cold snap and the green shoots all get killed off. And yeah. indeed that was their one chance to establish themselves early in the season. Well then guess what? You end up with a hell of a lot less uh, potential for those green shoots to grow into healthy plants. And that's kind of what we're, where we've ended up now. Yeah, it doesn't, um, you know, it's not great news, is it? It's not, no. uh, it's not particularly positive stories that we've got coming out. And yet at the same time, it is remarkable how uh, the likes of the equity market, uh, global stocks have been, you know, outside of Russia, of course, and especially the American stock market has managed to shrug a lot of this off and remains unconvinced that the end is nigh for uh, the enormous increase in asset prices that we've seen uh, over the past 10 years. I mean, do they, everyone thinks that the market's very smart. You've got, uh, you know, Barton Biggs uh, with Wealth, War and Wisdom, where uh, it's a very good book for anybody, anybody watching, where he makes the case that effectively the US stock market uh, accurately predicted that the Second World War was coming well in advance. Uh, it was it was discounting this because the uh, combined intelligence of all of the market participants uh, was such that the market figured out as a whole that World War II was coming before it did. And so uh, when you try and apply that same level of intelligence uh, to the stock market today, uh, what, what what is it that the uh, the American stock market knows that we don't or the or it sees in the future that we don't? Well, again, the stock market, oddly, does tend to be a lagging indicator at times. And and you saw this going into 2008. You know, the, the credit markets were seizing up almost a full year before the stock market noticed. And and certainly, uh, if you if you take a look at the First World War, uh, stock markets did not falter me, uh, materially until hostilities did commence. And so they did not see that one coming. As you say, uh, the Second World War, you know, Perhaps that looked a bit different, and and, there, and certainly there were a series of events leading into that, which would have concerned just about anybody. And it played out over a period of years, whereas World War One played out—that is, the start of it—played out only over a period of weeks. 
So I think that the stock market today uh, is faltering a bit, but again, it has not yet adjusted by the amount that I would argue should be implied by the pipeline stagflationary pressure that you can see in the data and in commodity prices, uh, where you also look at uh, what's happening in the credit markets. I think the stock market is is trying to look through this. And I'm not sure that's right. I'm not sure it's that easy to get from here to the other side. I mean, come on, there's always there all there's always another side somewhere if you wait long enough. Uh, but I, I think the stock market is still looking it, it's still a little bit uh, panglossian, as, as it were, uh, in its in it, the implied outlook, especially in some sectors. And again, I rant on and on about it, but multiples on big tech are still obscene. Uh, in my opinion, notwithstanding the corrections that we've seen recently. Now, just a quick message to everybody who is watching this live. It does seem that we have a bit of a, uh, a YouTube failure this evening. Uh, we're not being able to stream to YouTube, or at least some folks are able to watch us on YouTube, and a lot of us are not. This is uh, quite uh, quite a shame, though at the same time, uh, we are recording this, so the uh, and anybody who is watching, uh, if you have missed some of it so far and you have just uh, switched to Facebook, there will be a recording of this available on YouTube once it starts working again. We are working on uh, making sure that we can get it live uh, and we shall keep you posted indeed. In the meantime, uh, good evening to everybody who has tuned in on Facebook or on LinkedIn. Uh, indeed, and if you, know, if you want to post any questions in the chat, do feel free to do so. Um, it does look like there are quite a few people waiting on our YouTube channel and they're not able to get it, but uh, we are working on getting that chat live. Uh, John, uh, just as a, as a follow-on question to this, we've been talking so much about inflation. Uh, today, of all days, the Bank of England has come out and said, aha, don't worry, guys, uh, we've raised interest rates by 0.25%. So uh, don't worry about 8% inflation. It's all good. It's fixed. We've done our job. What do you make of that? Look, it's just a qualitative move. Quantitatively, it is meaningless. You know, raising interest rates by a quarter of a percent when inflation is at this level, it just quantitatively, it's effectively nothing, right? It's effectively zero. Uh, however, the Bank of England has sent a qualitative signal that you know they do intend to be in a, in a rate rising cycle now for some unforeseen period of time. Uh, but you know, it's it just it's it seems they're coming along awfully late, uh, given where we are here. And uh, as I, and as I've said before, I think that's by design. I mean, this is not an accident. I think the Bank of England had made a decision, which probably has the uh, tacit, if not formal, explicit support of the government, that it was basically just accepted and, and understood that it that it could and should undershoot. Uh, or I should, or with inflation, overshoot its inflation target uh, for a sustained period of time. Now, I'm not sure they expected inflation to rise this far this fast, but I believe that that understanding was, it, what was very much in place and still is very much in place. So the Bank of England has has political cover, as it were, in in Westminster, coming from Westminster, uh, to allow it to do what it's doing. Now, I, I don't know how long that's going to last. Because eventually inflation becomes a political issue, one that can cause uh, you know, <laughs> governments a lot of trouble and can bring down governments uh, if yep. it's persistent. Uh, we're not obviously not there yet, but I do believe that the Bank of England uh, kind of was planning to do something along these lines anyway. And so now they're doing a symbolic 25 basis point rise just to at least show that they're paying attention, that they have at least a little bit of credibility left, that they're not, you know, an ostrich with their head in the sand. Uh, but but this is all very deliberate, in my opinion. Yeah, it does feel uh, quite quite convenient to have things are playing out. You've got, you know, the really high inflation that central bankers have been wanting for so long, ever since financial crisis, they've been dying to create inflation. And uh, and even in the years running up to the pandemic, were uh, all all about catch up strategies where they allow inflation to run really hot for well not really hot but uh, much higher than the two percent or three percent target that they have yeah, uh, for several years in order to make up for all the inflation that we've not had. Now it's here, 
and uh, they, you know, they must be celebrating behind the scenes, I'm sure, for all of their efforts that, uh, in creating inflation over the past 10 years. Look, I, 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 I suspect they are genuinely surprised how far, how fast it rose. Now, yeah. there are some of us who are not surprised that it rose as far and as fast as it did. Uh, but I think they are. I mean, I, you know, they have continually, continuously adjusted their forecasts upwards. But those forecast adjustments have always been very small compared to what's actually been going on. And I think I think in its most recent inflation report, uh, the Bank of England updated its uh, year end inflation target to something like four and a half percent. I mean, which is so unrealistic. I mean, I look, I, I know it's only March, okay, but still, if you look at where inflation currently is, CPI, and you take a look at where wholesale prices are and where commodity prices are, and 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 the idea that it's gonna roll over and come all the way down to four and a half percent or less by year end is it's not going to happen absent some horrific economic financial crisis that that totally trashes the economy this year. And, and of course, they don't want that to happen. So I, I think, again, it's largely symbolic. I don't think they genuinely necessarily believe all of these figures. But as you say, the general policy context of let inflation run hot and just play catch up with a few symbolic rate rises I think that was the the game uh, the the game plan that was agreed a, a year or more ago. Yeah, it does feel like a lot of the plans pre-pandemic uh, regarding how to keep inflation going and to ensure that uh, inflation can be kept above target uh, are now coming into play. But people aren't talking about it anymore, obviously, because inflation is here and nobody likes inflation, so the central banks can't really celebrate it. Uh, but when you're looking at the inflation that we see in this country and you see a 25 basis point rise as though this is this is the Bank of England doing its bit to, to end inflation. I mean, it's like giving a Kit Kat to the soldiers yeah. in Ukraine. I mean, like, oh, yeah, great. But it's not going to do anything. It's uh, uh, not a not a happy, not a happy day to be a British saver, certainly. In yeah. with that in mind, um, I mean, here we are in the UK. And we've got all these inflation pressures that we've been discussing uh, regarding uh, you know, oil, energy, just in general. And of course, we've got the food price inflation, which, uh, as I said in our last episode, is uh, making me really afraid we're going to see big famines this, this decade if it gets really bad with fertilizer, uh, with vitamins that are used in animal feed. We're seeing all of these uh, really bad supply chain issues uh, with these things. And uh, you can easily see how things could spiral out of control because you can't just grow new crops uh, at the you know with the click of your fingers, it takes a lot of time. Uh, and when you know when these grains go bad, they go bad. You can't uh, you can't get that. You can't bring them back. So with that in mind, John, I was just thinking in terms of how we are situated here in the UK. Obviously, we have our own agricultural industry. We have North Sea oil. How insulated are we from these forces? Well, that's the thing. Here in the UK, we're not insulated. This is very important. Look, we have look. Most of us do not work in what I call the foundational industries on which essentially all modern economic activity is stacked. And those foundational industries are mining, agriculture, forestry, fishing, and the energy that's used to process all of the above. Because basically this is where we get our food, our clothing, and our shelter. And all the other stuff that we you know love and enjoy in our modern developed economies is ultimately stacked on top of all of those activities. And if those activities are fundamentally compromised, which they have been by, again, a series of unfortunate events, beginning with beginning with COVID and now continuing on through you know, the, the war and whatnot, there's just no escaping it. But because we're so detached from those foundational industries day to day, most of us, I'm sure some people watching this or not, um, we don't appreciate what what the attachment is. It's still there. It's just we're, we're, we're just not it's like, you know, you you expect your food just to arrive in your you know McDonald's bag or on the table or whatever. But a hell of a lot of work goes into that on the, on the part of farmers and whatnot. And, and so we're very detached from it. But it is happening and it's creeping through and we will start seeing it on, you know, in, in the shops, on the shelves or the lack of stuff on the shelves, I think we're, we are going to get into a situation here, which could last a long time. It could last a year or more, 
where there are sim there are some products products we know and love and we like to consume that simply aren't available at any price i, I think that actually is going to start to happen and that, and that will shock some people also certain staple foods which are the ones that we all rely upon day to day milk eggs bread and so on these things may get a lot more expensive and that's a real issue for a lot of people okay so it is coming it is coming and and there's just no escaping it and, and the uk as i said earlier in the show it's a small open economy there's almost nothing that can be done domestically against this large of a global shock because the uk uh the, the trades with the rest of the world at a rate which is two to three times more than the euro area itself or the us itself to give two big examples because they trade, they're, they're such big economic areas, they trade with themselves a lot. Their external yes. sectors are a lot smaller. But in the UK, that is absolutely not the case. No matter what policy decisions are made here at home, it's going to be the state of the world at large that really determines what happens here. Indeed. And we shall continue with this. Just a quick heads up to uh, everybody who has tuned in. Um, uh, quite a few of you have made it from YouTube to LinkedIn and to Facebook. My sincere apologies that YouTube is not working this evening. Uh, I've been uh, just had, uh, while we've been discussing, I've been uh, speaking to our, our uh, tech analyst behind the scenes. And it does look like we're not going to be able to restart uh, our YouTube stream this evening unless we shut everything down and then sent out new emails all over again. We're already uh, we're already fairly into the show. So my sincere apologies to anybody who was waiting on YouTube missed the first part of uh, this week's show. Uh, it, is a, it is a shame. Sometimes the tech doesn't always work. Uh, and I apologize for anybody who was just waiting around uh, when we'd already started. This is quite frustrating, even though with the state of modern technology, you can't always get things get things to work properly. Uh, for anybody who has just joined us, very good evening uh, to you all. Uh, we were discussing at the beginning of the show the state of China with its lockdowns, as China's locking down all over again, uh, discussing whether or not this is deja vu for, you know, we're actually going back in time, back to March 2020 all over again. We're about to see more of them. Uh, John thinks that this will be a, a relatively temporary thing, or hopefully it shall be. Uh, but it has poured a huge amount of fire on the existing supply chain issues. Um, yeah, as I say, uh, good evening to everybody. I hope uh, that you guys are having a nice evening and apologize for the wait. Hopefully YouTube shall work next week. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we shall be surviving uh, in LinkedIn and on Facebook. So hope the uh, hope you hope uh, enough enough folks uh, can migrate over to those two platforms, which is not where where most people normally do tune into the show. It's normally from from YouTube. Now, uh, John, just uh, to transition slightly to uh, the next big part of, uh, of the show, the next big topic, I think, would be on the state of the credit market. Uh, so over the past, uh, well, ever since over the past three weeks, ever since the war began in Ukraine, we've seen a lot of different effects in gold markets. Commodities have occupied a lot of that with the petropolitics surrounding energy. However, uh, a lot of people don't understand the importance of the debt market, the global credit market, what this actually means for the financial system. We started to see a fair bit of stress in that market, though it is very volatile, has down days, up days, etc. Could you give us a, a quick intro, a quick description for why the credit market is so important to the financial system? It's important for several reasons. First of all, let's just think about how big it is. Look, we all watch the stock market. It's the volatile thing that we love to you know, invest in. And of course, it does you know, represent uh, expectations for corporate profits and therefore is used, of course, as an economic indicator in its, in its own right. But the market capitalization of the global debt markets is an order of magnitude larger than the market capitalization of the stock market. And what that means is that if the credit market behaves in a way which suggests that investors believe it's going to become more difficult to keep up uh, interest payments on their on their debt, then the stock market really should be paying attention to that. But history shows you that sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the stock market just kind of remains off in la-la land when the credit market's telling you something is wrong. So the credit market being as large as it is, uh, it should be watched. Now, it tends to be less volatile, but what that means is when it does do something, you, know, you better pay attention. The other thing is this, is that the credit market also is where if you're getting 
sort of the hidden signs of stress in the financial system itself, in the plumbing of the financial system, it tends to show up in the credit market well before it, it would show up directly in the stock market because this is where you see some concentrated pockets of leverage in the banks themselves. Banks are the most leveraged entities in the economy by an order of magnitude. And then, of course, the banks are lending to hedge funds that are themselves very, very leveraged players. And so if you're getting stress in the hedge fund sector, in the financials themselves, you know, that definitely bears watching and that tends to show up in the credit markets uh, early on. And so these are reasons why you want to pay attention to it. It's big and it's a potential leading indicator of what could be coming. And so, yes, when you see, you know, the credit market acting the way it well, actually has been acting uh, in recent days, you know, you pay attention. And we've had a handful of scares like this in recent years that have never panned out into big stock market corrections, only small ones. But that's because in each and every instance, the Federal Reserve and other central banks kind of, kind of came to the rescue to ease what appeared to be building stress in the funding system, the financial funding system. So we may be beginning to see something like that again today, which, of course, <laughs> would call into question any central bank's indications or plans that they're going to continue raising interest rates because you tend not to be raising interest rates if you're concerned about a funding crisis in your financial system. Yeah, exactly. There's been so much chatter over the past couple of weeks from uh, central bank commentators, central bank watchers. Uh, especially over in the States with Jerome Powell uh, saying that, you know, this is Jerome Powell. He's getting his hawkish clothes on. He's going to make as big an impact on the world as Volcker did. You know, he's talking, he's talking really hard, but I, I just don't buy it. Like the, all of the, it's all just talk. It's all just forward guidance. There's not, I can't imagine there being a huge amount of action to raise interest rates when they've been waiting for inflation to come for so long. They've been saying they're going to allow inflation to run rampant well over their target for years before this happens. And uh, and at the same time, they're not going to risk a funding crisis, given the huge amount of issues that we now see across the world, be it COVID, be it Ukraine, be it energy, just in general. I just don't. Uh, but it, it seems very popular now. So I think that Jerome Powell has uh, returned. Uh, he's the reincarnation of, uh, of Paul Volcker. And I, I, you know, guys, I don't think interest rates are going to be really high anytime soon. But yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll look, be just, wrong. All you have to do is run the numbers as they are. And if you look at total economy debt relative to GDP in the United States, it is an order of magnitude higher today than it was when Volcker was in office. And so what that tells you is that Powell's hands are already basically tied, as you say. Sure, there are things he can do around the margins, but the ability of today's Federal Reserve chairman to really tighten the screws, deliberately cause a recession in order to bring inflation down and rebalance the economy, that ability today is arguably non-existent. And if it does exist, it is severely circumscribed by the perilous state, I don't use that word lightly, perilous state of the financial system. You're going to have to go through another financial crisis if you want to try and do today what Volcker did in the early 80s. There's just no way of, to avoid it. And no Fed chairman is going to deliberately cause a financial crisis. Sure, they might trade off a bit of economic weakness for a bit, a bit less inflation. And indeed, I think that's probably what Powell is going to be attempting to do, but nothing like what Volcker did. Yeah. There's a chart I think that we could uh, use to take a look at the at the debt market as it is today. So this is the uh, the famous junk uh, ETF. This is uh, the Barclays High Yield Bond Fund. So this is corporate bonds. Uh, corporate bonds is corporate debt, corporate borrowing uh, that has been uh, issued by uh, not very credit worthy companies over in the States. So this is an ETF that just is full of these junk bonds and it has the very convenient ticker JNK. 
Now, this is over the, the past few years, and you can see uh, March 2020, uh, it just went down the toilet, uh, really, really brutal drawdown. And for bonds, that's a re- you know, seeing it go from 110 to 85 there is a really extreme move, especially in that short a space of time. Now, more recently, we've seen it trade down a lot, but it's not, it's not as bad as March 2020, but it is traded down uh, to such a degree that it makes it hard to, th- to imagine that interest rates, central bankers are going to start raising interest rates into this. Now, even though it is junk debt, it's not, uh, you know, it's not you know, really high grade, it's not uh, really valuable debt. It's not something that's key to the financial system as a whole. But this is as a, an indicator of the, the broader debt market, the broader credit market. And it's very hard for me to imagine that, uh, you know, Jerome Powell or, uh, or Bailey over at the Bank of England is going to look at that and be like, yeah, you know what? It's time, it's time to raise interest rates. It's right, time to really turn the screws on all the bond investors. I mean, John, can you imagine something which, you know, which, might, which might cause them to do that? What would really push them to raise interest rates, uh, you know, cause a financial crisis, cause a recession? Uh, what would they be doing it for? I think they would only be doing it for political reasons. I think inflation has to become such a political problem that a a sitting government actually basically tells the central bank, look, the public understand that the only way to get inflation down is to really hit the economy hard. And that's just what we're going to have to do. That's the political choice we're going to make. I don't think of their own accord, central bankers are going to deal with this inflation problem. I think they're going to keep just massaging it, keep trying to buy time and let inflation remain elevated indefinitely. I think it's only when the political winds begin to blow the other way, which they were by the late 70s and early 80s, when that happens, and especially if you get a change of government and a new government comes in and can say, we inherited this mess and we're terribly sorry, but we are now going to sort it out. And it means a couple of years of pain, folks. That is going to kind of have to happen again if we're going to deal with this inflation problem. I don't think central banks of their own accord are going to sort it out. I, I really don't. Yeah. When, and with Volcker, it still wasn't, there was still huge resistance to the move. So as you say, even though you did have new political initiative, uh, we're going to draw a clean slate. But first, we've got to destroy all the stuff, the, all the rubbish the, the last guys left behind. Even then, I mean, there were, there were protests right in front of the Federal Reserve Building from all, all, all the farmers who were getting destroyed with these really, really high interest rates. To imagine that central bankers today who have been made up to be these uh, uh, masters of the universe, who have been made up as these celebrities on magazine covers for years. You know, they must like a bit of that celebrity status. It's hard for me to imagine that they're going to throw it all away and become the villains in order to save the world. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe, John, do you think uh, do you think there's any central banker out there who really wants to adopt bad guy visage? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think you have a handful of more sensible, traditional monetary hawks uh, in a handful of European countries, uh, the most prominent of which is Germany. You have uh, you know, a few other countries in the world, including Switzerland, uh, which, which ha- you know, will, might take a harder line on, on some of this. But certainly uh, the ECB as it is overall has a hugely dovish bias. They've made that painfully obvious in recent years. And the same is true of the Fed. The Fed is much, much more dovish in orientation today uh, than it was back in Volcker's time. It wasn't just Volcker, right? You had a number of prominent Fed officials who were very serious career bankers or academics who'd written papers on the importance of price stability, low inflation, stable money growth, all these sorts of things. At the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee today in the U.S., there is almost not one member with that sort of academic slant. And at the Bank of England today, there is almost not one member uh, of of any, you know, of any hawkish uh, influence. I think the last one was probably Andrew Sentence, if you remember him. He, He had a bit of a hawkish streak about him, but... He never got on with his colleagues. 
and 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 he's gone now. Um, so, you know, he's, he's anyway, there you go, right? The, the Hawks have been chased away by the doves, which sounds a bit bizarre, but, but yet that's the world we live in. Certainly. When you're thinking of possible scenarios that could actually create a Paul Volcker moment. So, you know, Johnny said, you know, it's not happening. I don't think it's going to happen either. But when we're thinking of manners in which a central bank could do this and then use something else as an excuse. Over in the States, uh, all of this gas in, gas price inflation, energy inflation, which was you know, persisting and, and growing well before the invasion of Ukraine, is now just been very conveniently, just like that. It's Vladimir Putin's fault. Now, that's, that's, why, that's why the cost of everything is going up. It's just Putin. You know, Jennifer Saki, the White House press secretary, has, met, has put it in no uncertain terms that uh, all of these problems, it's, it's just Russia's fault, guys. You just need to blame Russia. Do you think maybe... Uh, a central bank could just start vilifying another another nation uh, as this is the source of all the problems. That's why we've had to raise interest rates so much. That's why we did, we've done this to, and killed inflation. Because the worse these problems get, uh, you, there will be, there, ultimately, if you do want to, there to be something left of the value of money, of, the, of any kind of stability in the financial system, you do need to keep it, get this stuff under control. Absolutely. And look, one of the first rules in politics, right, is is the blame game. And you, know, you blame your opponent. And of course, to the extent that there's any amount of buy or multi-party consensus um, that the policies they've been following are so-called mainstream, well, then you have to blame a foreigner, right? So if you can't blame someone at home, you, you blame someone abroad. How easy, how convenient. I mean, that's that's just politics 101. That's the way the game is played. And because you've had for decades now in both the U.S. and the U.K., uh, you've had this, this this bipartisan or tripartisan, if you want to include smaller parties, you've, you've had this consensus that running monetary banking and economic policy more or less as they've been doing is, is the way to do it. It's actually kind of hard to blame the opposition because th there's not a whole lot of difference anymore. Uh, in turn, you know, every, you know, everyone wants to spend more money, and everyone wants to print more money to finance it. Okay, I mean that's just been that's been the consensus. And so, when you finally get into a situation where the chickens come home to roost, and you have persistently high inflation, which is becoming obviously politically unpopular, then everyone gets together and and, and blames a, a foreign country. Uh, back in the late seventies and early eighties, of course, everyone blamed the big oil producers. They blamed OPEC, but OPEC was really only formed as a cartel to deal with the debasement of the dollar that was beginning in the late 60s and early 70s. So really, OPEC was a reaction to breaking the dollar's link to gold and running inflation hot in the U.S. Um, OPEC was not what caused that. And, and, and so to blame OPEC, of course, is putting the cart before the horse. And blaming Russia for this, as you say, it, it looks pretty ridiculous, I have to say. I suspect most people see through it. Now, that doesn't mean they like Russia. That doesn't mean they think Russia are the good guys. But I think that most rational people, when they hear the claim that, oh, my God, Russia did this, I don't think they buy it. Um, and that may actually backfire politically because you look pretty out of touch if it's not even a plausible claim that you're making. Yeah, it's a... Uh, you, I imagine a lot of people are going to buy it. You know, uh, it's it's quite a convenient thing to. Uh, it's, it's quite a convenient excuse. All of this, I think, to to blame. And with uh, the Western press doing uh, such a good job of vilifying Russia and the Russian government, does uh, you know it, you're just playing? Uh, well, you're uh, preaching to the choir, as it were. Just having a, a quick look through the chat. Once again, apologies, folks, for the. Uh, for the lack of a YouTube stream this evening. It is very frustrating. Uh, thanks to Robert, uh, who said he was waiting uh, on YouTube and told uh, told the folks in the chat there that it's working here on Facebook. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, and uh, a good evening to Andy, who has just joined us uh, this, this evening. Uh, Jasmine comments, if we have food riots and petrol price riots, then governments will be forced to take draconian measures, I think. I would definitely agree with that. That's the only... The only thing I can imagine that would cause central bankers to actually stop the uh, to actually really intervene and raise interest rates very very strongly. That's the only thing that makes me think actually uh, we will get a Paul Volcker moment. We will see 
a big rise in interest rates. I mean, uh, John, do you think, yeah, I mean, food riots, petrol price riots, it's not something you want to see. We got kind of perilously close to petrol, uh, almost a petrol, petrol riots, uh, you know, back in 2021. Do you think that kind of thing is imminent or can this be averted? Look, I don't think it's imminent, but I'm concerned that governments have track records, unfortunately, of making bad problems worse. They try to impose things like price controls. They might try to impose things like rationing, which may sound well-intentioned and whatnot, but in practice really only take a screwed up situation and make it even worse by not allowing markets to sort it out for themselves. And there, there's an old saying, I mean, take energy, for example, there's an old saying in the energy market that the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. Because if you just sit back and wait, higher oil prices stimulate more production, they stimulate uh, more drilling in future production. And yes, it may take a year or whatever it is, but oil prices can come right back down again if you just allow the marketplace to work its magic. The same can be said for food. The fact is, the world is remarkably able to feed itself. You have you know, bread baskets in, in multiple countries around the world that produce a huge surplus of grain. And we've got massive logistical infrastructure to move food around and preserve it while it's being moved around and store it and so on and so forth. Um, None of that stuff has suddenly disappeared. The problem is, is that you've had all these negative supply shocks rippling through energy, food, and so on. And the best thing to do is for politicians to do nothing. And, and I know that's hard because, again, I, I mentioned politics 101, you know, the first rule of politics a moment ago. Well, one of the other, you know, top rules of politics is you've got to be seen to be doing something. So, so yes, if food price inflation is becoming an issue, if store shelves are you know, lacking certain items that people are accustomed to and so on and so forth. Yes, I mean, po some politician is going to try to make hay by speaking up and saying, hey, OK, you know, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to spend even more of your taxes uh, in order to try to sort this out. But you know what? It really only just does more damage. Uh, so it, it, I, I hope I really, really hope that notwithstanding what's already happening, politicians sit this one out and allow markets to sort themselves out. Uh, but if history is any guide, I'm being a little bit optimistic about that. Yeah. Uh, when we were talking about previous policies that were discussed before the pandemic, and now, of course, before the invasion, which may come to the fore, I can't help but think the mon modern monetary theory, um, theory that it's taxation that should be used to control inflation and not interest rates is going to become really popular in the near future. So, and you know, you already have. I, it'll right become suspects. popular. It, yeah, well, it'll, be, it'll become popular with politicians. I'm not sure it'll become terribly popular with the electorate. I mean, it's one thing to say that we should raise taxes to cool our economies and dampen inflationary pressure if you're starting from a historically low tax base. But when you're starting from the highest level of taxation ever, outside of wartime, it's much more difficult to say, oh, gee, by the way, taxes still aren't high enough. Look at the inflation. We should be raising them. It's not going to go over very well. You know, raising someone's taxes from 10 percent to 15 percent, you know, they, they might be will, able able to, to do that if they think it's a temporary measure for whatever reason. But going from 50 to 55, 60, uh, much more difficult to pull off, in my opinion. So they may try it but I don't think it's going to work. Yeah, it all depends how you sell it, right, John? I remember, uh, this was a few years ago, Ben Hunt, the uh, market commentator, uh, who has a very interesting insights. He has a, a shop called Epsilon Theory. I think it's called Third Foundation Partners. He writes some, uh, lots, of interesting, uh, lots of interesting observations on the market over time. And uh, I remember a while back, we said all, it was all about narratives. So he speaks about everything through, uh, the, through the focus, through the lens of narratives and what people believe. So like the common knowledge game, everyone believes what everyone else believes. You know, what is it? What are these pieces of common knowledge that everyone thinks everyone thinks everyone else knows and how that can change? And one of the uh, predictions he made was that 
at some point, there's going to be a political leader who is going to be able to sell the idea that high inflation is actually a good thing. There, you're going to feel great about high inflation. And for, you know, you know, until now, I was like, mm, you know, how I, I didn't really see that happening. But now we've got Russia and you've got politicians saying that high paying through the nose for petrol is your patriotic duty. It, it now suddenly seems very possible. A political leader just emerged and said, yeah, you know what? I think CPI should be 15% because that means we're really putting the screws on the Russians. Do you think we're going to see something like that? Well, again, I think politicians will try. I, I just think they'll fail. You know, we're, we, we, we've already been witnessing a historically meaningful populist wave of politics uh, in much of Europe and much of North America, which arguably has been exacerbated by COVID uh, because, as we know, uh, these lockdown policies uh, have been very, very unpopular uh, in a great number of places. And indeed, they're, they're now being rescinded, of course, because, well, I mean, the, the po politicians will say they're being rescinded because the disease is more manageable now. But I, if you're a little bit more skeptical like me, you think that they're, they're doing it in large part because they realize they've run out of political capital on this one. So we've already been, been seeing this, this, po this populist wave building uh, in recent years. And so I think politicians may try to make that sort of argument. You know, inflation is good for you. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy, you know, whatever it is. Right. Um, it's our patriotic duty. Um, you know, but that, that's a very slippery slope because when you start saying, hey, you know, we have to make your life difficult because it's your patriotic duty. Um, you know, that's going to that's, that's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. And God forbid, uh, in the U.S., for example, if they if they reinstitute the draft and start taking young men, and nowadays perhaps they would also draft young women and take them away uh, from their homes to potentially go fight in some foreign war. Well, we we know what happened to U.S. politics uh, during uh, the Vietnam War. It was extremely disruptive, uh, and 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 you ha and you had protests on a scale that is way beyond anything we've seen uh, recently. So, so again, to to to, to make it short. Politicians may well try, as you're suggesting, but they're going to meet a lot of populist headwinds if they try to do that, in my opinion. Yeah, though at the same time, John, uh, it, it becomes a political opportunity. The poor economic conditions generally see a, a big stoke in nationalism, patriotism, and it just becomes a political opportunity for the person that can galvanize and uh, you know bring, you know, rally the 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 electorate as though they're troops. I can. I can quite easily see that happening. Uh, but when you t start talking about conscription and the draft, um, you know, it's very, very grim indeed. Uh, some very interesting comments that we've got in the chat this evening. Um, let's see. The uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Matt comments, I think they're going to collapse the economy and just say it's all gone. Well, Matt, I, uh, hey, I really hope they don't. Like, like South Park. <laughs> yeah, it's all gone. It's all gone. Um, oh, yeah, hopefully not. But, you know, anything's possible these days, isn't it? Uh, Seamus comment, comments, Boaz, is that hazy screen, your beer goggles coming on? Yeah, apologies for the folks on my camera going really funny uh, a while back. I, I Hopefully it's fixed. Sadly, it's not my beer goggles coming on. I gave up booze for Lent. I've still got a month more to go. Very grim indeed. Uh, though it's actually it's actually not nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. I've, I've discovered that life is just very boring when you don't have any alcohol. But anyway, uh, moving moving on, uh, Seamus also comments, waiting for election election slogan, being poor together, uh, which, uh, you know, may, does, may seem rather far-fetched. But I remember my brother spent quite a long time in Cuba and he, th and, you know, they're you know, incredible, incredible poverty. Like you can be a very skilled doctor and you still need to have like two different side hustles just to make ends meet. You might be making shoes or or, uh, you know, selling uh, some other handcrafted goods in, just, in order to, uh, just in order to get food on the table. I remember him saying that despite everybody was, uh, everybody was uh, you know, very poor, everybody also had a very uh, heightened sense of superiority to the gringos who would come over because it was almost like, you know, we're all poor, but we're still better than you. And I feel like maybe, you know, maybe that political slogan could work in, in this kind of environment. It is getting uh, very, very, um, yeah, it... Ultimately, this war is making things uh, very bad, as all wars do. Uh, but politically, it's morphing what people are open to. Uh, it's changing. You, know, you end up, uh, similar to the lockdowns, you end up 
uh, siding with different folks than you would have otherwise, who would you know generally lean differently, uh, because things become more authoritarian, libertarian, uh, and things like that. Now, just in terms of uh, the you know the state of state of inflation, Stephen comments: Why would they want to end the inflation problem when it is solving their debt to GDP problem as time passes? Stephen, I agree one hundred percent. I believe John does as well. This, you know, no one's no one's saying it's a good thing in the public eye, but mark my words: behind closed doors, I think central banks are popping open the champers and are very, very glad that this is the inflation is the way it is because it's solving the problem that they've been uh, obsessing over for at least a decade, if not more. And you know, obviously, no one's going to say it. And you know, you, it's this that kind of closed mentality that leads people like uh, Andrew Bailey at the Bank of England to say that workers should not be asking for higher wages. Like what, what world must you be living with in what, you know, who must you be rubbing shoulders with and dealing with on a day to day basis that you would think making that comment publicly would come across? Well, yeah, guys, inflation is 8%, but don't worry about it. Uh, And uh, also don't ask for a pay rise because that's just going to make the problem worse. Here I am in my public sector job earning six figures with an enormous defined benefit pension scheme that comes from uh, the Bank of England's uh, private defined pension ba- scheme. Like it's just, uh, yeah, it's 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 ludicrous. But it is solving the debt to GDP problem, and nobody wants to make it sound like that's a very good thing because, of course, it's uh, destroying uh, so many people. But behind closed doors, you mark my words, uh, a lot of people are very happy uh, that inflation is really high. Though, of course, we're not among them. Uh, John, we are getting on a little bit for time here. Uh, do you have a long and a short for this week? Uh, as uh, you know, of course, huge amount of volatility. Uh, volatility equals opportunity in financial markets. Any ideas on what you'd be long this week or short? I would take advantage of the dip uh, in the gold price in particular, uh, which I think is, is, is larger than it really should be. Uh, the obviously gold got a huge boost when war bro- broke out. I mean, that's what normally would happen. But this is qualitatively different uh, for gold, in my opinion. And it's not just that inflation's high, and it's not just that there's a war going on. Uh, although obviously these two things are very, very relevant for for gold, in my opinion. But there's a third thing here, which is this whole this whole angle around to what extent gold can be used as a way to get around sanctions. And this is what I find really interesting. Did you see, now I don't speak Russian, but I saw a translation of a, of, of a speech that Putin gave um, yesterday. And he makes specific reference to how Russia has prepared itself for possible financial sanctions by basically uh, stockpiling real assets of various kinds. And he specifically refers, of course, to their very substantial gold reserves. That's an interesting comment for him to make in such a prominent way. And I don't think he would be making it unless he was already in discussions with China, Kazakhstan, possibly a few other countries on how they can now mobilize gold as necessary to facilitate cross-border trade and get around what a lot of these countries see as unreasonable uh, sanctions that uh, that the U.S. and other countries are imposing. The, but it's interesting coming from him. It's just a very very high level comment coming from coming from him about gold. It, 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 I, I would have expected, you know, the, the, the Minister of Economic Affairs or a central bank official maybe to make some passing reference to it. But for Putin himself to do it, big deal. And why that's so important is I think if there are any indications that indeed cross-border trade is taking place uh, using gold between multiple countries with Russia, I think that will lead to a massive surge in general global official demand for gold because every country will learn the lesson. If you cross the United States, and it doesn't even have to be a war necessarily, if you cross the United States, you may face sanctions. And if you face sanctions, you may have difficulty trading with your key trading partners. However, if you acquire some gold, you can get around it. Big message for central banks, in my opinion, generally. And I expect that this it could lead to a qualitative shift 
in the official demand for gold, very supportive of the gold price. So that's my long. I, I really think that the world's learning a lesson here about the importance of gold when sanctions get severe, war or no war. Yeah, it does feel like the US, when they decided to freeze the foreign exchange reserves, uh, and the US and the EU decided to freeze the foreign exchange reserves of Russia, effectively making foreign exchange reserves uh, a, a, politi a geopolitical plaything. Well, in a way they they, they demonetized it, right? Yeah. They, they demonetized Russia's reserves. That is confiscation. In, in, in international law, don't get me wrong, obviously war is illegal, fine. Uh, invading a country is illegal. Fine. I get it. But confiscating another country's property is also illegal, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. so there's, there's, I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. War is hell. You know, there, there, but there, there are rules being broken left, right and center now. And one of those rules, this one regarding the sanctity of foreign reserves, uh, that is going to cause gold to re-rate at the international level as an essential thing to have on hand in a crisis. So I think it's very gold positive and no one's going to just forget that this happened. Okay. No. This is so, so anyway, I think, I think gold has a big, big tailwind here for, for a number of factors, but one of them is pretty new and potentially very significant. And then as far as being short, I've already mentioned it. I think the stock market is still off in la la land. Uh, that's concentrated in a, in, in, in big tech and a couple other sectors uh, it's act actually when it comes to basic industrials, they don't look particularly expensive. They don't look cheap either, but they don't look particularly expensive. So the strategy in the stock market really is sector rotation. Uh, however, for a defensive investor, there's nothing wrong with simply lightening up. Uh, but I feel that the huge market cap of big tech, when it comes off more substantially, and I think it will, is going to drag the broader market down overall. But there are some safe haven sectors in which to hide. Of course, precious metals miners being one of those. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting pair for a long and a short. I do agree with you, John, about the uh, regarding foreign exchange reserves because ultimately, you know, people can uh, you know can disagree with the the war as much as they like. And obviously, nobody wants war. War is hell, as you say. Uh, but when it comes to the United States and the you know the EU, effectively the the European countries effectively confiscating Russia's foreign exchange reserves, which Russia had earned legally. I mean, these weren't, weren't the spoils of war. They had been uh, earned by, by Russia legally. This uh, it makes the whole concept of foreign exchange reserves become, uh, you know, what is the point of owning these when they can just be taken away? Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it, it seems like a massive misstep by Russia to have accrued them and not to have thought that they might be confiscated. But maybe one of the reasons why Russia didn't do that was because they thought, well, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot if you start confiscating other people's foreign exchange reserves, because that reduces the, the desire for anyone to own foreign exchange reserves if they can be simply taken away in that way. Uh, Luke Roman, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, gold, uh, the gold commentator who John and, and, uh, and I uh, do know and have interacted with, uh, said recently, uh, I believe he's in a podcast, how effectively the United States and Europe had just told everybody to go out and buy gold in doing that. <laughs> because gold is one of these assets where you don't have to worry about that. That's why you have it in, in, your, own, in your own custody. Uh, but we have, uh, I think, reached our full time for, uh, for this week's show. Again, big apology to everybody today who is waiting over on the YouTube link. I apologize for that. Uh, it seems like we've had a bit of a technical issue. Though thankfully, we have managed to keep the stream going on uh, Facebook and on LinkedIn. Uh, we shall have a recording of this, hopefully, on YouTube for anybody who missed the first 15 minutes. Uh, and next week, hopefully, we'll have everything working once again. We may be having a show during the day next week. Maybe we'll have Nikolai Hubble, who is on GB News, of all places, uh, today on next week. But we'll let you know in, a, in an email next week. Uh, thanks again to everybody who has tuned in. Apologies if we haven't answered all of your questions. Some very interesting comments this evening. Uh, and we'll try and get everything right next week. That's all for this week. Thanks again, John. And uh, yeah, we'll see everybody in the next one.